trip has turned out to be amazing. Absolutely amazing. Leaves are starting to change. Those are starting to look pretty. Man, in about a week, week and a half, 10 days, it's really gonna be pretty here. My campsite for tonight, 10 bucks. And there's Wi-Fi here, man. Times have changed. When I did my bicycle tour in 2016, I did not have access to Wi-Fi in the middle of nowhere. Spent a lot of time in the middle of nowhere on that. I rode from Anacortes, Washington to Glacier National Park. And being away from technology was kind of nice. But I'm gonna utilize the Wi-Fi tonight to be able to upload a video for you guys. Lake McMurdy, Flirty McMurdy. That's what I'm gonna call this place. Hi, I have a reservation for a campsite tonight. Do you know which one you're at? Number one, the tent site. Beautiful. Thank you much. Have a good night. Thank you. everybody's perception about the Harley Iron 883 and not having enough power is way off. I've passed so many cars and so many semi-trucks by utilizing what I have. And it's a lot of fun to figure out how to really ride this thing to make it get up and go when you really need it. It entails a lot of high RPMs, but it's still fun to do. Does the bike vibrate? <laughs> It's a Harley, hell yeah, it vibrates. And yeah, when it's at those high RPMs, 35, 36, 38, 4,000 RPMs in some cases, when you're in fifth gear, going 75, 80 miles an hour, yeah, <laughs> you're sure as hell gonna vibrate. It's still a lot of fun though. Oh, it's still a lot of fun. Even with all that weight on there, I mean, I got an extra, what, probably 75 pounds on the bike, 
plus me, anybody who says that it does not have enough power, they just aren't utilizing it to its full potential. I feel like I have. And, and after this trip, I'm gonna have a gear ratio, power, and how it relates to the 883, and also how it relates to a lot of two-wheeled vehicles, including bicycles. Bicycles and motorcycles work very similarly as far as gear ratios go. I've been teasing this for a little bit, but definitely gonna do this video once this trip's done, because it's, it's overdue, and it's, I think it's a really important one for the things that I'm talking about now. What else have I learned? Well, I come from the cycling world where weight management is a huge deal. That lightweight tent or that aluminum spork, those seem a little ridiculous to some people, but when you're climbing mountains, when you're going long distances on a bicycle, that really makes a huge difference. And I thought it would with this bike, and it does to a certain extent, but I can take a lot more on this bike than I thought I would have been able to. At this point in some bicycle trips, some cycling touring trips, where I've gone long distances, I've sent stuff home because I've been carrying too much stuff. I've actually added stuff. Well, I sent a laptop home that wasn't working and I bought a new laptop, but I've added a few things. I, I need a gas can for when I travel through New Mexico and Arizona. I've got more food on there than I would carry on a bicycle. It's, it's just a manner of managing the shock setting it to the specs that you need to. And for lightweight me, that's not difficult in this bike. You know, I'm only 150 pounds, so. Yeah, the small gas tank is a bit annoying, but it's a good thing because it forces me to get off the bike. Something that I need to be better about. I tend to want to keep riding to get to that one destination to make sure that I, I get enough miles in for the day. But because of the gas tank, I'm forced to stop every 100 or so miles to make sure I have enough gas to get to the next destination. And that forces me to get off and, you know, use the restroom or uh, walk around a bit, stretch my legs. And that first day, I didn't get off the bike enough, and I should have. I, I talked about that in a previous video, how I just wanted to, to continue on to get through Chicago and how I overextended myself on the bike. But two things are happening, and here's the next thing that I've learned out of these two things. One, I'm forced to get off the bike, but the, thing, the next thing that I learned is you get used to riding long distances. Uh, it was true for the bicycle for me, where I was able to put more miles in each subsequent day on the tour. That's definitely the case with the motorcycle too. Regardless of the stereotype of some Harley riders is for non-motorcyclists, or even for some motorcyclists that don't ride Harleys. You know, the overweight, beer belly, bearded, tattooed dude, which clearly I'm not one of, and I know a lot of Harley riders who are not either. Despite that stereotype, it's a physical thing to ride a motorcycle. And that's exceptionally true when riding long distances. With the extra weight on there, I need to balance more. I'm using my core muscles and I'm using my calves. Um, I'm definitely using my Achilles. I, I find myself needing to stretch my Achilles on both my legs uh, after a long ride because I'm constantly flipping my foot up and down using both my calf and my shin muscles here and thus using my Achilles quite a bit to do that. And it gets stretched out while I'm riding, but you know, especially when I wake up in the morning, I need to stretch that Achilles a little bit more. So I, I notice that first few days, especially after that first day, I was pretty sore. Now I've gotten used to it where I could keep going. Like right now, if it wasn't, you know, an hour before sunset, I'd be out there riding still. I'd still get, keep going. If it was middle of summer, I'd be able to do, you know, 12, 13, 14 hour days because the days would be so long. Another thing I've learned is people are super friendly. They want to come up to you and they want to talk to you. And that's, and that's more true for some areas over others. But when you're on a motorcycle, unless you're out here alone like this, you're not going to be lonely. People are going to want to come up to you and talk to you, find out what you're doing. and and uh, what you're experiencing. Every time I stop at a gas station, somebody, whether they're a motorcyclist or not, wants to talk to me. I met a couple yesterday 
right after I crossed the border in Oklahoma. They were from Northwest Arkansas. They were antiquing. I believe it was Julie and Shorty. And if I'm getting those names wrong, I apologize. I'm definitely getting Shorty's name right, but I, I'm not, maybe it was Charlotte. I gave you both a business card. If you're watching this video right now, I apologize. Please comment below and let me know if I got your name right because I, I know people's names are important to them and I like to remember people's names. Uh, and I like it when people remember my name. Uh, but they were uh, antiquing flea markets and whatnot. And they left at 8.30 in the morning and it was about, oh, 3, 3.30 by the time I, I met them. I was just, I just stopped for a little bit to make some adjustments on my bike. I think just adjust some straps or grab a drink of water or something. She saw the license plate and said, you're an awful far away from home. And I, I said, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I told her what I was doing and just having a wonderful conversation with Shorty and, and her was, was, was a lot of fun, you know? In a previous video, I talked about Roy and chatting with Roy was a lot of fun too. And I'm just meeting all kinds of really cool people along the way and learning about them. In fact, it reminds me of one of my favorite books and that's John Steinbeck's Travels with Charlie in which he gets into his truck with one of those campers on the back, his pickup truck, the camper on the back. And he's traveling along with a, a French poodle named Charlie. And his goal is to kind of discover America. And he travels around and learns about people's lives and what they're like and what motivates them. and What is America like? Kind of like a modern day de Tocqueville for some of you history buffs out there where he traveled around and wanted to know America, wanted to understand America and the people within it. And what's interesting about the Tocqueville and John Steinbeck is there is a similar thread into what they discuss. America has changed quite a bit, but in some ways we're very similar to what it was like for the Tocqueville in the early 19th century. I feel like I'm discovering people the same way or similarly. I don't want to compare myself to John Steinbeck because I'm not. I'm nowhere near John Steinbeck's intellect and writing abilities. But he named his truck Camper Rosanati after Don Quixote's horse. For those of you familiar with Cervantes and Don Quixote, and Don Quixote and Rosanati are, are kind of one and the same. They're kind of double, right? They're they're both perceived to be, if not to be, awkward, past their prime, and in a task way over their head. Am I doing the same thing here? <laughs> I certainly feel awkward. I'm talking to myself right now. And sometimes I feel awkward when I'm putting videos out. I'm definitely past my prime. I'm in my now mid 40s. My 45th birthday was recently. And quite possibly, I'm on a task way over my head, beyond my capabilities. And I'm, I don't normally like naming objects, cars or bicycles or motorcycles, but right now this feels a little fitting. So I introduce to you Rosanati. Rosanati's a lot like me. It's one of those love it or hate it motorcycles, so it's awkward. Its technology is definitely past its prime. As I said in my review video, 60-year-old style wrapped in 30-year-old technology. And realistically, well, at least perceived to be doing a task well beyond its capabilities. I'm touring on an Iron 883. We'll see if it's up to the task by the end of this trip.